Just a heads up, we reference some sensitive material in this episode. We hope you enjoy the show. Art is created by people, but people are fallible. When the art we love is tainted by the brush of an artist's biography, we must ask whether the shift is in our aesthetic experience is reasonable. One might also wonder whether the artworks can do wrong in and of themselves. If artworks can be intended as conveyors of truth, can they convey falsehoods or, more awkwardly, lies? These aren't just conceptual problems. If artworks lie and immoral artists are inseparable from their artworks, how should we respond? Should we censor all art, some art, or no art at all? In this episode, we'll be discussing the ethics of art with Cambridge University's Dr. Daisy Dixon. Dixon's work, which explores the nature of and responses to unethical art, invites us to place art within its context, to consider artworks in relation to their artists, truth functionality in relation to an artwork's surroundings, and dangerous artworks in relation to their curation. If we do so, says Dixon, we'll not only gain a better understanding of art, but how we can bring about a better world. Hello and welcome to episode 107 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the aesthetically irrelevant Jack Symes. I'm joined once again by the rightfully censored Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And the artist whose moral character adds to the value of their work, Dr. Daisy Dixon. Hello. Daisy, it's really great to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. So the first question we ask all of our guests to get going, nice easy one to start. <laughs> what is philosophy? Oh. <sighs> That's mean. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me what's art. I was like, well. <laughs> Actually, I do think answering what is art is easier mm. in, in some respects. What is philosophy? Well, I tend to divide it between the an interest in certain phenomena, mm -hmm. but also its method of inquiry. So obviously there are various traditions of how to do philosophy. Mm. And my experience and training has mostly been in analytic philosophy so I tend to see it as the kind of systematic, rigorous investigation of reality that can range from our minds to the nature of properties, colour, mm. nature of things, artworks, nature of existence itself, and of course, morality. Cool. So how do you see the relationship between philosophy and art? Do you see art as a subsection of philosophy or the other way around? I've struggled with this question for about 15 <laughs> years now. And I used to think that art was a kind of way of doing philosophy. Mm. But given that the method, obviously, I think is important to analytic philosophy, they are very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're making conceptual art, there will be some stronger crossovers there. Mm. I think art also is a kind of particularly deep way of investigating reality as well. Perhaps it's far more kind of involved in sort of nature. So it's hands on, you're manipulating material. Mm. You also don't often, I've learned the hard way, <laughs> the best way to make art isn't to kind of have too much of a telos or a kind of idea mm. beforehand and to just sort of play around and make mistakes with your medium. Whereas doing philosophy when you're writing a philosophy paper, the way that you think mm. is quite different. Would you disagree with the idea that, so we had Vid Simonitiani said, philosophy is the art of conveying ideas. To, to push you on this, if someone <laughs> said to you, no, philosophy is a subsection of art. It's the art of argument, the art of thinking deeply about things. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. And I think what Vid Smiliti said there is definitely on something. Mm. I think that's just a looser way of using the word art. Mm. I mean, there's a creativity in doing philosophy, of course. There's a lot of skill and craft, yeah. which art also has. I just think so in that looser sense, yes, it is a subset. But I think actually doing art in the studio or out of the studio and dealing with the art world, mm. I'd say the the worlds are actually quite different. So you've mentioned there, Daisy, that you spent about 15 years grappling with these <laughs> questions of art and philosophy. What is it that initially drew you towards philosophy and specifically the philosophy of art? Funnily enough, philosophy of art, I started to tackle very late on in my sort of student training. Mm. I realized that I found doing art quite easy at school. Mm. 
it was the only thing I found easy at school. <laughs> That's a humble brag. So they, so there, but uh... I know, but it's not really in the sense that I struggled with everything else. And obviously teachers back then were just like, well, you got to go do what you find easy, which mm. wasn't the best approach. <laughs> but I noticed when I was doing art that it was one of those features it has in common with philosophy, which is that kind of interest in how we as human beings relate to the world mm. and each mm. other, what we owe to each other, how we experience reality. And I think it was those deeper questions that got me interested in in philosophy more generally. Mm. Yeah. And then I did philosophy at A-level. But then just so happened that obviously I then went to art school and just did art there with a sort of minor in philosophy. Mm. It's one of those joint degree subjects, but they were taught quite separately. And I still didn't really know which one I wanted to do. But then when I ended up doing a master's in philosophy, I just ended up doing philosophy of language. Mm. I just really went straight into that and found it really interesting. It was only when I got to PhD level that I was like, I'm going to do aesthetics now, which was interesting. Mm. But because I thought, oh, this will be easy because I already know about art, but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so going there for something to find easy is something quite challenging. I quite like that. That's quite a cool journey. Mm. So our next question is normally connected to, is there like a philosophical text that got you interested in the topic? And we've had many guests say things, you know, like Plato's Republic and Descartes' Meditations. More recently with some of our guests specifically about art. So when we spoke to Vincent Maniti, who we've mentioned already, he said he loved the works of Dostoevsky. So we got more into kind of like philosophical novels. When we spoke to Bensei Nane, he said he was influenced by people like Sartre and Camus. Is there a philosophical text about language or aesthetics that really got you interested in the philosophy? Well, it's interesting you say those works there. So definitely initially getting into philosophy, it was Descartes' Meditations. Okay, nice. And it was actually Plato's Republic that I was sort of looking at at A-level. But also... Sartre's existentialism as a humanism oh, that no. absolutely was what got me into philosophy initially okay. and I loved Camus the Stranger mm. as well but again this kind of philosophical literature mm. I really loved but the work that really I guess got me into philosophy of art was Anne Eaton's What's Wrong with the Female Nude mm. and also her paper where aesthetics and ethics meet where she does a study of Titian's Rape of Europa mm. yes now she's obviously a contemporary philosopher mm at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and also being a woman in philosophy. Mm. Taking a slight left turn now, so that's the philosophy bit, but is there any particular artists that inspire your own artwork? You are an artist as well as a philosopher. Are there any particular artists that have had a big influence on you throughout your life? Yeah, it's funny. I was talking to a friend about this the other day and I, I worry my answer is really quite boring. <laughs> um, growing up, my complete inspiration, two of them, were Vincent van Gogh. Okay. Mainly because of his own personal life and mm. his own struggles with mental health, mm. but the way he was mostly underappreciated mm. in his time, but also the way he pushed the boundaries of Impressionism. Mm. I'm not actually a big fan of Impressionism, I always confess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I loved his way he pushed it into this new kind of genre in its own Expressionism. So his kind of bravery and courage mm. with the paintbrush in, whilst he was very solitary. And I loved his expression of emotion in that. But also Van Gogh, Titian, I was growing up, I wanted to be an old master. I just wanted to paint like the old masters. And of course, Francis Bacon was my more recent favorite with the way he navigates the body mm. and relationships and how he expresses that with his mark making. Mm. I just find stunning and I try and emulate that in my own work. But I'm always conscious when I answer this question that what my inspiration has been growing up, I never mention women artists. And it's because like most people, we didn't really know about mm. many of them. So yeah. I always want to mention Artemisia Gentileschi in there as well, because I've learned more about her as I've got older. Mm. Um, the Baroque artist who responded to her own sexual violence through her painting as a kind oh, of wow. revenge art. So she's another favorite. Wow. That sounds really interesting. So many of the philosophers we've spoken to, and this is a, a question we like to ask all of our guests as well, have intellectual heroes that inspire them on their journeys or have a significant impact on the views they develop. So some examples from previous guests, Kate Mann, Rebecca Buxton, and Richard Swinburne said, hashtag no heroes. <laughs> uh, Rutger Bregman, after a quick Google search, said Bertrand Russell, Susan Blackmore, Billy James, and most recently, Michael Housekiller said, Alfred North Whitehead. Has there been anyone who's been particularly influential on your own thinking, Daisy? Well, of course, there were the philosophers I mentioned, like whose writings mm. influenced me when I was an A-level student, like Sartre which I and Simone de Beauvoir, which is interesting because I didn't really go into that kind of style mm. yeah. of philosophy. But again, in all honesty, my training in philosophy has mostly been 1950s onwards. Mm. And the person who's like inspired me and influenced my own work so much is Professor Ray Langton. Cool. 
at the University of Cambridge because yeah. she supervised me a bit in my master's and she was my PhD supervisor. And again, she doesn't work in aesthetics. So she's worked in pornography. But I just loved her kind of way of using philosophy of language and applying it to really important social issues like how pornography might be harmful mm. and just her influence on feminist philosophy is just astounding and from so early on she was writing like groundbreaking papers on this so you still get to see her like now working at the university of Cambridge? yeah i mean covid sort of stopped mm. that a bit but she's yeah. still a mentor and when she's got a spare few minutes she'll look over one of my draft papers oh, um awesome. but again also i think it's important having a role model yeah mm. for women in philosophy as well so yeah Mm, fantastic. So we've got another classic question coming your way, Daisy, and you're going to have to give us a bit of help with this one. So this is a question that we really like, but we seem to get a bit of pushback. We with. might have to cut it soon. We might have to cut it soon at this rate. Yeah, if we don't get, a, yeah, don't get a new answer us. soon. So a question we like asking, is there any significant philosophical position that you've changed your mind on? Now, recently we've had people say no, 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 no. We've had no uh, for a long time. Lots of people have just said no. Uh, but we've had some examples from the past, but the audience is, you will know these one guys. So Eugen Nagasawa said he was converted to theism from atheism by the ontological argument. Rutger Bregman, the other way around. Sam Coleman said he's gone from agnosticism to pantheism. So some very religious ones here. They don't have to be religious. I need to think about this one. You don't have to say yes either. <laughs> no, I mean, the one thing I'd say is I grew up basically an atheist as well. Mm. When I came across Anselm's ontological argument, mm. actually that was going back to the other question you asked. I was like, something must be wrong with this argument, but it's <laughs> so beautiful. Like I just found it beautiful and it did make me rethink my belief in, in God. But I wouldn't want to choose that one though as a position because I'm more agnostic, but that's not really from philosophy. It was actually art that changed my mind mm -hmm. about that. Can I push you on the ontological argument point? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm really happy you've said you like the ontological argument because I get teased for liking it quite a lot when we speak to people. People like to turn their nose up at The reason because you're agnostic, not because of the ontological argument? What, you grew so, up an atheist. Yeah. You like the ontological argument, but the reason you're agnostic, did you move from atheism to agnosticism? Yes. So the ontological argument was the one that really made me think I want to do philosophy because cool. there's just a beauty in the logic. Yeah. And I wanted to find the fallacy. I was like, I want to find what's wrong in that argument. Mm. And it's just obviously presented often as the more sophisticated mm. argument compared to like Descartes' one, which is a bit easier to find mm. the fallacy in that one. The move into agnosticism was actually through, this sounds so pretentious, but like <laughs> when I You're was You're an at, artist, Daisy, that's okay. I know. <laughs> when I was at art school, near the end, I was making sound art and cool. um, I was investigating how God as a concept might be more of a sonic property. Yeah. Mm. And that just shifted my thinking about what God could be. Right. And it didn't needn't be this like traditional concept, like almost a personified being mm. with traits that people tend to have or like moral traits. They can just be the force that makes strings vibrate or atoms vibrate. And the way we interpret it might be through sound. Obviously, I'm really interested in more ancient religious music mm. and things. So this is like a side interest in sound art and music. But yeah, it just made me think maybe God could just be a way that people interpret something Mm. that we can't explain mm. and that's a very trivial thing to say and it's not a new thing but it just made my concept of god just widen a bit well we're grateful for a, a new example that perhaps we, <laughs> can, really? we can we can bring in there <laughs> yeah uh, something which is never going to be new is how bad my segues are into part one Part one, immoral art. So knowing about an artist's background, whether it's a film or a show involving a, a sexual predator, and unfortunately we're not short of examples there, or a painting produced by an evil dictator, the fact that these artworks are created by these immoral characters seems to descriptively affect how we experience or value their work. And I don't think that descriptive claim is particularly a controversial one. It does impact in certain contexts. But perhaps the more controversial and interesting question is whether our reactions to artworks should be sensitive to biographical detail. Are we wrong to let their biographies influence our experience of their art? So I wonder, as a way in here, why might somebody say that an artist's biography shouldn't affect their artwork? Why might someone say the artist and the artwork are completely distinct things, so you don't need to think about 
fact Hitler painted that painting or think about the fact that that comedian did some horrific things. You can just focus on their stand-up. You can just focus on looking at the painting. This is definitely quite a popular position. The idea that we can and should separate the art from the Mm. artist is often used as a defense whenever people start talking Mm. boringly about the origins of an artwork. That view does have a lot of precedent. It has a lot of historical kind of philosophical theory behind it. So it's not a kind of nonsensical, silly view to have. Right. And it, it basically comes, you know, people may not know this when they believe that, but it does stem from this movement in the sort of early 20th century, sometimes called formalism, sometimes called aestheticism. Mm. There's this idea that the value of an artwork, so what makes it good as an artwork, but also its content, so how we should interpret it and engage with it, is exhausted by its kind of internal properties. When I say internal, I just mean if we're dealing with painting, just what it looks like yeah, and how its formal features hang together. So mm. shape, color, composition, and the kind of aesthetic experience this might generate. And there are different ways of cashing that view out, but mm. it's essentially, you know, sometimes people might bring in Kant's view this idea that our aesthetic experience should be disinterested. So mm. we kind of become almost invisible. And there's different ways of interpreting this. There's probably some Kantian scholars out there not liking how I, I say this. But it's this idea that we make ourselves sort of invisible when we engage with the art. and mm. We don't bring any, any of our own prejudices or worries or beliefs to the interaction. And we just engage with the artwork on its own terms. Yeah. So in that sense... If we should just care about what an artwork looks like or sounds like, what its internal content is, if we bring the artist in, then we're doing something wrong. Right, okay. And it's fair to say, Daisy, you completely disagree with that interpretation (laughs) of art, right? Completely. You think Kant's wrong here. So you would say that an artist's moral character can be aesthetically relevant. Are there any particularly good examples of immoral artists that can offer a way in here where knowing about the artist is useful? A good example would be either Pablo Picasso or Paul Gauguin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. As uh, a French. So they were both painting at slightly different times. Gauguin was painting in the 1800s and kind of again within this kind of impressionist movement. Obviously Picasso mm. was painting later in the 20th century and developing Cubism. But both of them in their lives abused and sexually abused women. Mm. In Picasso's case, Again, quite young women. Mm. Um, I, I don't have the details on the exact ages, but I think maybe one of the lovers was 17 while he right. was in his 40s mm. or 50s. But with Gauguin, the case is even more clearer. So he, when he did his famous Tahitian paintings, mm. and this was towards the end of his life, but he really broke into the art scene. This is where he really made his artistic mark on art Mm. history was with these portraits of these girls, but also of landscapes when he went to Tahiti twice, I think, Mm. and stayed there for a long time. But the portraits are of his child brides. Right. So they're not just these random sort of, well, they're often called young women, Mm. but they were about 13, uh, 12, 13 year old girls. And there was this kind of desire to move away from so-called European culture and restrictions. He wanted Mm. to be free in what he called Eden. Mm. But actually by that point, it was completely colonized. Yeah. I never really thought about this in relation to his paintings, but they're kind of lies as well, Mm. because he was kind of presenting this world as if Mm. untouched by, you know, the West, whereas actually it completely was. And all these women and girls were going to church. With the case of Picasso, because I think that's one, at least listeners will have heard Mm. his name, if not seen his art. But you've got illustrations of women who are essentially portrayed as instruments, aren't they? Has he got a quote about saying that women are either like goddesses or doormats. That's it, yeah, it? I believe it's his granddaughter who writes that he used to kind of crush the women into his canvas. There's a metaphor, mm, I should right. say, but he was essentially using them as muses, but kind of abusing them at the same time. He cheated on his wife, Olga, mm. a lot. I don't like the word cheat. So he had a string of lovers. He was abusive towards them, but with some of his paintings, that was more my interpretation of the instrument quality because yeah. in some of his paintings, I think it's a, a lover's dream, mm-hmm. I think. I'll have to double check that. But he's like turned half of her head into a penis. Mm. But there's another one where she's, again, Mary Therese, one of his lovers, I think he was about 17. It's a very beautiful painting mm. and that's something we can talk more about. It's like, how do you 
deal with that, where she's kind of blending into the chair. Right. She's sort of enveloped into the chair. And it mm. was just when I was looking at that painting, it reminded me of Man Ray's piece of the woman who's turned back into a violin. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of people might think, well, it's just cool. Like, it's like a cool piece. And yeah, it is cool. Like, look at this idea that, yeah, Yeah. it looks good. But you've got to situate that into a history where women are objectified in day to day lives, but also objectified in art. Yeah. And there's a whole long history on that, too. Mm. Can we like maybe weave in like a more kind of more modern, maybe contemporary example that some of our listeners may be aware of? So we've got the examples of statues of slave owners in America's deep south. Uh, they're often used as an examples of, you know, some people may say that these statues perpetuate racism, that they were deliberately made to kind of remind people that, quote unquote, the wrong side won the Civil War. Daisy, do you think it's possible to appreciate those statues, the paintings of Picasso, without bringing in all of this other stuff, all of this difficult history of misogyny, racism? Could you potentially look at a statue or look at the work of Picasso and go, that's just a really well painted painting, that's a really well sculpted sculpture? without knowing anything about the history of it? Yeah, it's a good question. I say you definitely, obviously going back to separating the art from the artist, you can, a lot of people do, just appreciate the artwork for its aesthetic properties Mm. and aesthetic value. But I would say that they're literally like a quarter of the way towards understanding the artwork itself. So if they're only interested in the surface level of whether it's beauty or grace or power Mm. that a statue might express. That's fine to some extent, but they're not really doing the artwork justice. It's kind of like they're just looking at a facade and it's Mm. like, well, aren't you interested in the real thing? Mm. And I think the real thing is getting the ontology of artworks correct. And by that, I just mean we need to understand what artworks actually are. Mm. And they're not just decoration, even if an artwork is intended for decoration, that is still a contextual element and it's going to have a movement and something behind that. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all our inspiring patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man who can always be found in a trendy, kooky art gallery. It's Mr. Adam Cool. The man whose art stirs emotion and brews despair. It's Mr. T. He's not a blasphemous, dangerous artist. He's a very naughty boy. It's the life of Brian Ramirez. She's immune to censorship and being placed in a box. It's Miss Lily Hooper. Stuck in a surrealist painting of a giraffe on fire, eating a cupcake. It's Andrew Cherryman. The Chilean actor who loves Nick Cage and Baby Yoda. He's not Pascal, but he is Pedro. He's a massive fan of Renaissance art and sculptures of Christ. It's St. David Ligeness. He has strong views on the question of whether cheese is art. It's John Breeden. He's the greatest of all time art critic. That's right, John Gautier. His favorite painting is Klimt's The Kiss. Can't imagine why. It's Michael Kissley. Political art that embraces counterspeech takes his breath away. It's Jamie Lung. He's lost his copy of The Color Wheel. It's Jay Wheelless. And the man whose name is so mysterious and can be interpreted in multiple different ways, the pinnacle of abstract expressionism itself, it's Moron van der Kolk. If you, dear listener, want to help us cultivate artistic speech and bring the world more inspiring art, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. So you use a really interesting thought experiment to counter this formalist approach. It's Danto's Red Squares. Do you mind telling our listeners what this artwork is and what it shows us? Yeah, so it's a thought experiment from Arthur Danto's Transfiguration of the Commonplace. And it's a brilliant way of explaining why this kind of formalist approach is wrong and how the nature of when we think about what an artwork actually is and therefore Mm. what we should value about it and what we should look for when we're trying to understand what it actually is. So he asks us to imagine several identical red rectangle canvases on the Mm. wall but he kind of tells us different things about them so they're all done by different artists they depict different things so the Mm -hmm. first I think the first one's like Israelites crossing the Red Sea Mm. and it's just red and you've got a I think it's a cynical follower of Matisse and it's just Mm. like red tablecloth or something then you've got red square which is just a Mm -hmm. minimalist work and then you've got another piece that's just an unfinished primed canvas so it's not an artwork at all and he actually had a broader goal to use this thought experiment which is this idea that 
we need context and what mm. you might call artistic properties. So the time and place has been created, the yeah. artist's biography, maybe mm -hmm. their oeuvre and the movement it sits in. We need all of that to actually decide if something's actually art or not. Yeah. Mm. So it's not just to show that things you can't technically see in the artwork are relevant to determining mm. its meaning and value. It's also to show that artworks are these strange, peculiar things. It was Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes that really got him mm. interested in this. He sort of describes them these, there's something sublime. Mm. Like he brought Andy Warhol, the idea of ready-made art really mm. pushed this because it just suddenly broke the boundary between mm. what, you know, art and not art yeah. and challenging that. But clearly Brillo boxes are art because we have all these external things made by an yeah. artist to put in mm. a gallery and so on and so forth. So you mentioned there may be the biography. Mm. And what if someone thinks... Well, Daisy, you're obviously right. I think if Picasso's depicting a woman in his art, then his views on women inevitably come into that. If you want a full account of the artwork, if you want to understand this big part of the artwork, which isn't on the canvas, you need to look at the background. What would you say to someone who asked you, where do we draw the line as to what kind of stuff's relevant? Do I need to know how many unpaid parking fines this person has? <laughs> how many gray hairs are on their head? What street they grew up on? Do I need to understand the full person, just those quote unquote relevant things? How do I know if they're relevant? Yeah, so that's a very urgent question. That's something philosophers are currently working on. This is like brand Ooh. new research. So in an article I wrote three years ago now, mm. I adopted approach by a Scottish philosopher, Beres Gort, another big inspiration for me in aesthetics. And he generally writes about the relation between art and morality. And he, yeah. he does talk about how an artist's immorality might affect the artwork. But he goes for what we tend to call now an empiricist approach. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he very much is in agreement with this idea that artworks are more than just what you mm. see. But interestingly, when he says about where do we draw the line, he says once you hear about the artist's immoral attitudes or beliefs or actions, but you can see evidence of it in the painting. Mm. So he's sort of reverting back to a bit of a formalist approach where he's saying, so for example, if Picasso had loads of parking fines or yeah. he did something that was totally bad, but was unrelated to what you see in the painting, right? then that's the kind of criteria for kind of determining whether it's relevant. The fact that in one of Picasso's paintings, one of his lovers looks literally like furniture yes. is more relevant than the fact that he may have not paid some parking fines because it's not a painting of his lover as a car. It's because she's like a sofa, right? Yes, exactly. So there has to be like a formal trace of whatever attitude we think is relevant. But I would say that that view, I'm presenting a paper on this next week in Prague. So it's like quite new in my head. Another philosopher brought out a book a year or two ago looking more at this question, Ted mm. Nanicelli's Art and Ethical Criticism, I think it's called. He brings us back to contextualism and says, no, we don't even need a formal trace right. of an artist's immorality. Mm. He says we need to look more at like what the motivation was for making that painting. Okay. So he does mm. use an example of paedophilia. Mm. So he brings in this example of you've got, it's a horrible example, but it does show the point quite well. You've got a photograph or a painting mm. of a naked girl, mm. but she's not sexualized mm. in the painting or the photograph. It's very neutral pose. Mm. There's no kind of formal trace of composition or anything to suggest mm. that there's a sexualization in the manner of depiction, mm -hmm. which is what the kind of empiricist might say. Yeah. But Nanicelli would say, but if the artist has made it with a motivation of sexual gratification mm. yeah. to look at that painting then that is relevant. And he mm. brings in, it's a brilliant account of virtue ethics to say that the reasons we do a certain action often determine the moral value of that mm. action. So if yeah. I'm working in a homeless shelter as a volunteer because I genuinely care mm -hmm. about people who are homeless, then that action is better than if I was doing it to mm. impress a love interest. Mm. So it's a similar kind of thing there, even if the motivation isn't formally there. That seems right, or at least one of those, if not both of those accounts, that both things seem relevant there. But I can't help but think, maybe this is a little bit naive and just shows my lack of a background on such topics, but I think when I see like Hitler's painting, I see no trace of the atrocities he committed. I assume that his motivation was to show the landscape or beauty in the landscape, mm. yet it's clearly relevant 
that it was done by an immoral artist. And I think I, in research this episode, saw they were going for like half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Some of the people who were selling them were saying, but well, if you walk down a street in Berlin, you'd find like eight out of ten of the artists you walk past will have better paintings than Hitler. <laughs> so what is it about them? Well, it seems like the moral character of Hitler is relevant there. And to fully understand the painting, you should need to understand something about Hitler's character. Is that a that's, good that's counterexample? That's a great example. Interestingly, that is the example I use to mm. expand this motivation account. Yeah. So for Nanicelli, he says that the motivation needs to be directed at a certain painting. So uh-huh. you, the, mm. the painter needs to want to get sexual pleasure or gratification from that piece of work. Mm. This is kind of might sound pedantic, but it's good for like philosophical circles. That's philosophy, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> I basically am <laughs> wanting to expand. So that's another view I have changed my mind on. I used to be an empiricist. Oh, okay, cool. I was with Beres Gort on this, and now I've read this idea of motivation. I'm like, oh no, that seems mm. right. So I want to expand this idea of motivation to include, yeah. I call them less easy cases like Hitler, paintings. Mm. Mm. So I actually think the more you look into Hitler's paintings, whilst he probably didn't have a particular motivation to Mm. express anti-Semitic beliefs or Mm. even Nazi propaganda, because he was painting them before the First World War, most Mm. of them, and in Vienna. But it was around that time that he started developing his anti-Semitic beliefs and his interest in German romanticism. Mm. And actually, when you look at his paintings... I say they are composed of Aryan aesthetics. Mm. So very fine detail, idealistic landscapes, vague figures. But Hitler being Hitler is what I think imbues like his interest in Aryan art, which then would become sort of Nazi art. Mm. That is relevant, even if it's not directed in that specific way. There's got to be examples of artworks where it's more difficult to bring it in. So... Maybe something like Louis C.K., yeah. who's, what are we saying, is a sexual predator, a sexual offender. He's been charged, I think, isn't he? Yeah, mm. he's a sexual offender. He's an asshole, yeah. let's just say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, but maybe he makes jokes and does stand up, nothing to do with sexual assault and just jokes, like knock knock jokes. Let's say Louis C.K., his right. next tour was just a series of knock knock jokes, which would probably be a vast improvement on his history of comedy. But the point being is that it's not relevant at all mm-hmm. to it. However, it seems like my aesthetic experience is rightfully shaped by here's a bad man making me laugh. Like the fact he's making me laugh should be relevant to my experience. Is that a good counterexample? Or, yeah. or is, again, can you make the connections between? Going back to your question about where you draw the line, we do want to draw the line. We don't want mm. to start drawing it in like ad hoc mm. ways. We want it to be a robust reason as to why we're drawing the line here and there. Louis C. I actually don't know his comedy that well, but I have read about it and I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure it turned out that his jokes about masturbation and things, is that him that he re- yeah, think- turned out to be actually based on things he did? Mm, um, great example. So, but that's good for the empiricists because they're like, yeah. clearly his immorality has a direct link to like the content he's talking mm. about. The example I use to kind of capture what you're talking about is Rolf Harris's paintings. Right, okay. Um, I actually really like his paintings. That's kind of the way I used to like to paint. Mm. But he's got a lovely painting of an Australian landscape called Blue Hills. And he's literally talked about the painting. He did it from imagination. He, I think he used leftover paint. Very mm. basic painterly exercise. There was no motivation there concerning sexual gratification of children. Mm. There's no formal trace because it's a landscape. Yeah. A lot of people, my mum included, who had a print of this painting when everything came out about his child sex offences, she took it down. Yeah. Mm. And that got me thinking, well, it's fair enough that she's done that, but is the artwork itself been affected by this? And I draw a distinction between, again, this is brand new work Mm. and it's very rough and ready. (laughs) I think what we're reacting to is the artefact, not the artwork. Mm. So artworks are artefacts, Mm. but not all artefacts are artworks. Basically, it's this idea that if you found out that a basic chair you owned had been made by Hitler yeah. in like a wood workshop mm. at school or something, mm. that's still a fact, this origin of the artifact mm. that it was made by Hitler. But I think we're reacting, like to a case of Rolf Harris's paintings, we're reacting to the painting as an artifact. I don't want something that this man made. So do you mean like object? Yeah. Aesthetically, I can look at this painting and really enjoy it, but I don't want the painting of a known sex offender in my home. Yes. And that's what you're responding to, not the actual aesthetics of the painting itself. Yes, exactly. I would say that 
the content of the artwork is not affected mm. by Rolf Harris's immorality. Mm. Right. But to explain our still felt conflicted reaction, I'd say we're just reacting to it as an object. Mm. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I was reading your papers when I was on a family holiday last week and I had a friend who didn't know philosophy in, in the past at all. Asked him what he thought art was. And the first thing he said was, this yeah, is going to be good. I like no, that we have some dreadful <laughs> answers. I say the first thing he said was, I'm doing a massive justice there. <laughs> Eventually he reached the view. A necessary condition is that it's an expression of self. Mm. Now, if art is an expression of self, then it does seem like it's always relevant, right? That it seems like Rolf mm. Harris is expressing himself in the painting somehow. And I, this brought to mind some of Sartre's work. And in taking this quotation from his essay, What is Literature? And he says, quote, Doubtless the composition is also inhabited by a soul. And since there must have been motives, even hidden ones, for the painter to have chosen yellow rather than violet, it may be asserted that the objects thus reflect his deepest tendencies. However, they never express his anger or his anguish. They are impregnated with these emotions. People think that Sartre thought that the soul or the extension of self or an extension of one's consciousness was in the artworks which artists create. And if that's true, then it's always relevant to the person, isn't it? So I guess you just disagree on what art involves there or you have yeah. some sympathy for it? That's a really interesting idea. And obviously I'm not doing that view justice. I'd have to look more into it. But there is similar stuff about the relation between the intention and the artwork yeah. Yeah. where I think there's a neo-Wittgensteinian view that was recently developed that basically said, much like when I decide to like lift my arm, the mm. intention's part of the action itself. Mm. In that way, the artist's intentions are kind of already imbued in the artwork. I like that view, but in that sense, the artist is always connected to the artwork because they've yeah. made it in mm. a very basic sense. But the idea that their consciousness is somehow in the artwork, I think... It's a little bit kooky. It's a, <laughs> it's a very... Yeah, I think that's a quite... I don't want to say nonsensical, mm. but it's a lovely idea and there is a sense mm. in which it's correct. But I think when we're looking at how an artist immorality affects the content of the artwork, the aesthetic experience it invites. These are all quite, and there's more I can say about this, but the meaning of an artwork, it's closer to language than you think. When we look at a painting, it can make us as a viewer think of anything. Mm. But that doesn't mean the artwork is about those things. So if you see Van Gogh's The Yellow House, it might remind you of your grandmother's house. Mm. Fine might make you feel sad or it might make you feel nostalgic. That's all fine. That's why art's so important to us mm. because it's a very personal thing. But I'm quite strict about what an artwork actually means. It's a bit like language. It's a communicative object made right. by someone, mm. but it's using a, whether that's pictorial language or whatever that might be. And I think there are restrictions to what it can mean. But Van Gogh's The Yellow House is not about your grandmother's house. <laughs> it's about the house. It's about the house he grew, he was working in where yeah. his mental health deteriorated and so on and so forth. Is that where he cut off his ear in The Yellow House? I believe so. Yeah. Went around that time. And it's also where he lived with Gauguin for a mm. bit. Awful man. That's another reason why I don't like Gauguin because he was mean to Van Gogh. Red on the inside house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you see them as speech acts? Is that I do. I see them as speech acts, amongst other things, not just speech acts. There is something to the idea that artworks are imbued with the artist's soul in some way. I think that's a nice idea, but from that view, to get to the claim that an artist's immorality is always affecting the artwork, mm -hmm. it's a big leap. And yeah. also, again, I think I can capture that felt reaction by just saying... You just don't want an object made by that person yeah. rather than claiming the artwork itself as in its content has somehow been altered. Because again, go back to the language analogy, I can't mean anything I want by my words. Mm -hmm. Like Humpty Dumpty can't just say nonsense and think he can communicate to Alice. Yeah. It's kind of the same in art. Like if I paint a landscape and you say, oh, it's about paedophilia. Mm -hmm. well. Mm. unless we bring in like contextual evidence here that yeah. the meaning of that landscape or something mm. paintings aren't just about anything whatsoever yeah. so as our final question daisy to kind of bring together some of the more abstract concepts we've been discussing and bring them to something quite concrete so let's say i listen to a particular type of music by an artist that i know has a problematic past right i know the gallagher brothers 
used to rob cars in Manchester. Did they? Right, right they did. Did not yeah. know that. Yeah, there you go. You mentioned Rolf Harris is actually one of my mum's favourite albums is an album by Kate Bush that has a spoken word passage from Rolf Harris on it. It oh, was wow. actually taken off after the allegations came out and they replaced really? it with somebody else, oh, which wow. I think is really interesting. Or you have like a really horrible example, like the lead singer of Lost Prophets, who was later found out to be a paedophile. Is that Ian Watkins? I think so, yes. So if we still listen to Lost Prophets, the old school Kate Bush album, and still laugh at Louis C.K. jokes, are we then almost making like a moral claim like, well, I know what the history is, but I don't care. It's more the work itself that I'm enjoying. And I still have the right to enjoy it. How would you respond to that kind of thought? Yeah, there's definitely Eric Matt's new book, Drawing the Line, where he is a wonderful quite short as well which is always nice always good we like that <laughs> book yeah. about all these um, he really goes into a lot of details like all the different moral relations between motivations as to what we should do as consumers mm. of the art the question of how it affects the artwork itself is one thing but mm. yeah so in answer to your question I mean the first thing to say is you might not want to benefit or add to the estate of that artist so you just you don't want to help them out in any kind of way by buying their music yeah. whatever and of course, you need to know kind of the way the artwork has been made. Mm. So as long as like no one's been kind of... So we're assuming mm. it's like completely morally neutral. It's yeah. just been made by mm. a bad person. Mm. Apart from like helping them out financially, there's also a view that how you appear to your peers and how you might not want to imply that you think it's fine. It might turn into like a guilty pleasure or you might kind mm. of perform to society. I'm not going to consume this person's work because... I don't think they deserve. Yeah. Or another way is kind of the idea of cancelling. You might think that this person's done so many bad things. They don't deserve to have their art enjoyed mm. by people. That was what they wanted. So yeah. you might do it as a kind of um, a way of like protest, yeah, or revenge to the artist by saying mm, like, right, I'm okay. going to just drop your art from the world. Like yeah. that's mm. a pretty damning mm. thing to do. I would say, though, I always think about this with Michael Jackson. Mm, I yeah. adore Michael Jackson's music <laughs> and I yeah. still listen to it. And mm. there were some radio stations a couple of years ago across the world, actually, that just banned yeah, his yeah. music. And But I still love his music and I still dance to it. Mm. And I am aware of the tension there, but it still makes me dance. Mm. Yeah, it still I makes do, you yeah. want to move. I do tense up when you like when you said, my mom's got this painted by Rolf Harris and like they're beautiful. And I tense up a little bit when you say, yeah. like I dance to Michael Jackson songs. Like there is almost this knee jerk reaction to say, well, you're not allowed to do that. When you're doing that, you seem to be excusing or like ignoring something for your own benefit. Yeah. Mm. And that it feels almost like you're doing something selfish. In research this episode, the amount of sites I found for like, there's a website dedicated to like send messages to Kevin Spacey. I think he was convicted or at least mm. accused mm. of sexual assaults and uh, psychological abuse of some type. And loads of people just saying it's unfair what happened to him, mm. writing into him thinking, well, if it wasn't him, if he didn't love his art, you would mm. think he was a dreadful person for what he's done. And so it seems like it happens the other way around as well, right? that someone's good art can impact their moral character and raise them up. Our friend Justin Brierley at the Unbelievable Podcast has an exciting event coming up. Renowned psychologist Dr. Ian McGilchrist, author of The Master and His Emissary, will be in conversation with Christian neuroscientist Sharon Dirix on whether there is a maker behind the mind. It's taking place at the British Library on the evening of Saturday the 14th of May as part of the Unbelievable Conference 2022. You can attend in person or online. Online includes a pay-what-you-want option too. More details can be found at unbelievable.live. This live dialogue is part of their forthcoming Big Conversation series, which will include guests such as Richard Dawkins, Francis Collins, Rowan Williams, Paul Kingsnorth and Michaela Peterson. Look out for the whole series launching late May. For more details and tickets for the live conversation between Ian McGilchrist and Sharon Dirix, go to www.unbelievable.live. I think also we do tend to give artists a strange position in society we mm -hmm. often like raise them up on high as some kind of pedestal where we think they're kind of separate from mm -hmm. reality yeah. we can treat them all they're kind of exonerated just because mm -hmm. they created brilliant art mm -hmm. and absolutely the fact that michael jackson the way he changed pop mu the history of pop music what he did what he was alleged to have done because i don't think he was he wasn't found guilty no. i think in the end wasn't. um that doesn't justify assuming he did do those things mm -hmm. obviously it doesn't justify him making his art but then it gets 
more tricky because mm. you could say we wouldn't have his music if he had been brought up a different way. Like the reason mm. he dances like that is partly because of the discipline, yeah. partly mm. the discipline of his father pushing him from such a young age. Mm. But that obviously his father's abuse absolutely would have contributed to what he was alleged to have done mm. to the children. Mm. So in that sense, it is hard to separate the two out. But I do think there is something about by consuming their work, whether that's going to look at their paintings or dancing to their music. I think what you said, Jack, is right because it kind of signals you're kind of excusing it. Yeah. When mm. really, you're internally, you might be quite conflicted, but yeah. sometimes mm. people will just stop consuming it because they just want to mm. performatively say to society, like, we don't think this person deserves our yeah. mm. enjoyment or praise. Well, I think we'll talk about some of this in the next instalment when we're talking about censorship and how to respond to dangerous or immoral or unethical arts. And playing us out for this week is Michael Jackson. Just kidding, it's <laughs> Mystery Philosopher. The Mystery Philosopher. So you're going to hear the voice of a mystery philosopher from the present. This philosopher is still alive and well. You're going to hear a quotation from the mystery philosopher and you've got to guess who it is. Your aesthetic responses are what they are. You should not let anybody police them. Who might that be? Contemporary philosopher of art? Hmm. Give you some clues if you need them. Ben St. Nene? It is Ben St. Nene. It is. is. Yeah. Very good. You got that quicker than I did. That was really good. (laughs) Yeah. uh, We did interview him. (laughs) (laughs) Nice guy. I had to get one that you could both have a chance of of getting. And you did admit a few times that you haven't done much philosophy. So it had to be. It's true, actually. It's going to be him or Vincent Medici. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't remember that for the next episode, Daisy. My (laughs) my clues were I was quite excited to share my clues. Floppy hair. Oh, some chat. That narrows it down. Cravat? Does he wear not cravat, but doesn't he wear like he had like a fancy? Shirt. Does he wear a cravat? Not a I've... cravat as such, but I've seen him wear neck kind of. He's a cool guy. He adorns his neck or something. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Mm. He adorns his neck with something like decorating. Does yeah. he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't notice that. He's also the guy at the end of each show, and listen out for it this week. Who goes? That was great. Wow, you guys really read up on this. <laughs> <laughs> That's people familiar with him. Join us for our next one where we'll be talking about lying in art as well as censorship and how we should respond to immoral artworks. We'll see you then. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Psychast. The next installment of this episode will be available a week on Sunday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the next instalment of the show. To support the podcast and get yourself heaps of extra perks, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast or hit the link in the iTunes description. To find out more about the show and get all of our old episodes completely free, you can visit thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys... uh managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly i think beautiful fantastic oh well done you guys gosh you're doing a wonderful thing with this (laughs)